It is now time for question period. I recognize the Deputy Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, Dr. Peter Uni, the head of the Premier's own science table, called this uh, sixth wave a tidal wave. He says that wastewater measurements of COVID mean that uh, Ontario has now between 100,000 and 120,000 new COVID-19 cases a day. That means about 5% of the whole province is infected. We have more COVID cases than ever before, Speaker, and the Premier is just calling this a little uptick. The Premier believes that we have the hospital beds to handle this, but the reality here in Ontario is that we don't have the staff for those beds. As much as the Premier might wish that this pandemic is over, it isn't. Why is the Premier simply waiting for hospital beds to overflow with patients before taking any proactive actions? I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. In fact, the increase in cases that we're seeing now is expected. This is something that Dr. Moore has commented on several times with the uh, release of some of the public health measures, as well as with the increased transmissibility of the BA2 variant that is now the dominant variant in the province of Ontario. But the situation has changed very much since the beginning of this pandemic, and to quote Dr. Moore, he has said this, we have tools that we did not have just two years ago, including highly effective vaccines that have changed the course of the pandemic, high vaccination rates that continue to improve as more and more Ontarians see the value of getting boosted to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. We also have the antivirals that are now being distributed more widely across the province, and we do have the capability within our hospitals. Answer. Today, the number of people in ICUs was 157. Yesterday, it was 166. We're holding steady and will continue to do so. Thank you. Supplementary, the Deputy Leader. Speaker, if the rise in case counts were expected, where then is the urgent action from this government to implement the tools that they have to help us curb the spread of COVID-19 in our communities and help do things like make sure that our children are not kept out of classrooms and that working people don't go without paid sick days, for example, or that small businesses won't be further managing disruptions because of, of COVID-19 spread in our communities. Patients are already having their care delayed. Surgeries have been cancelled. Um, piling up more people into hospitals mean that those folks are not going to get the surgeries that they need. The science table and other experts are calling for the continued use of masks, paid sick days and more testing in Ontario. But Ontarians haven't actually even heard from the Chief Medical Officer of Health for weeks. Question. What is the Premier's justification for dropping masks in hospitals and long-term care homes? I recognize the Minister of Health. Well, since the beginning of this pandemic, we have always taken the steps necessary to protect the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario. We are following the recommendations from our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Moore, and his advisors. Dr. Moore uh, has recommended that masks don't need to be worn, except in certain circumstances, in hospitals, in long-term care homes, and other congregate settings where it's necessary for the protection of people. Should Dr. Moore change his views in the coming days, we will be making those changes as necessary. Necessary, but as for wearing masks, it is something that is voluntary. Although most people are choosing to wear masks in crowded uh, public spaces, and we anticipate they will continue to do so. Final supplementary, the deputy leader. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Dr. Uni is worried that without the use of masks, our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. He also said that the government moved too quickly to drop the mask mandates here in Ontario. He said, and I'll quote, he's very uneasy, end quote, and worried that the wrong signals are being sent to Ontarians. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to hear from the best experts that we have. That includes bringing the Chief Medical Officer of Health out of hiding to explain what is going on here in Ontario. Why is the Premier ignoring the problem rather than taking proactive measures to help us get through the sixth wave? I recognize the Minister of Health. Our government has always taken the necessary steps to protect the health and safety of the people of Ontario, and we will continue to do so. We are following the advice of our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Moore, and his advisors, and the uh, science advisory table as well. The view of one physician compared to the views of many 
is something that we listen to, but we are following the advice of Dr. Moore. He has provided us sound advice throughout, and I know that he will continue to do so. It was Dr. Moore's advice himself several weeks ago to say that we don't need to have regular conferences with him because we learn, need to learn to live with COVID. Sadly, it's not going away immediately. It's going to continue within our system, but we have the measures that we need to keep people in Ontario healthy with increased vaccinations, including the fourth vaccination that's available as of Answer. today, the antivirals, and we do have the capacity in our hospitals to manage. I recognize the Deputy Leader for the secondary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my next question is also to the Premier. Speaker, we know that one of the biggest uh, gaps in mental health care is for our children. As more and more Ontarians seek um, mental health supports and are openly sharing their struggles, families and children are concerned that the supports that they need are out of reach and cost too much. They want their children to thrive and lead happier, healthier lives. But far too often, mental health services are out of reach because of horribly long wait lists and these huge financial barriers. Speaker, why won't the government recognize that universal mental health care will help families and kids access mental health supports in Ontario? Thank you. I recognize the Associate Minister of Mental Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the impacts this pandemic has had on the mental health and well-being of children and youth across the province. Building an Ontario where young people are safe, healthy, and thriving are the right things to be doing, and our plan impacts on those very issues. And that's why we've made targeted investments in intensive mental health supports and services for children and youth that include a $20 million investment across the board, 5% increase to all supports and services for youth. In addition to that, $2.7 million for four youth wellness hubs in Guelph, Renfrew, Timmins and Windsor. And in addition to that, another eight youth wellness hubs, again, to build on the supports necessary for youth. In addition to that, we've looked at specific youth wellness hubs for Indigenous populations to ensure that Answer. they have the supports they need. Mr. Speaker, we've made investments, including in eating disorders. They are solid investments to ensure that all children and youth have the supports they need when and where they need them. Thank you. Supplementary to the Deputy Leader. Speaker, Children's Mental Health Ontario has called on all of us to take the Kids Can't Wait pledge to invest in mental health supports for our youngest people here in the province. Mary Klusterman, the CEO of the organization, says, and I'll quote, some kids are currently waiting up to two and a half years to see a mental health professional, end quote. I know in my community of Brampton, that's an unfortunate reality for many young people who need supports. Speaker, it shouldn't be like this in Ontario. We're lagging behind in the country, and we need to do better for children with immediate investments to cut the weights and invest in the services that they need. Speaker, why hasn't the Premier recognized that children in this province can't wait any longer for the mental health supports that they need, and when are they going to make the investments to help us save lives and ensure children have access to the supports? Thank you. I return to the Associate Thank Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'd like to reiterate, our government is actively investing. Our government is at the forefront across Canada from the standpoints of investments that are being made in mental health and addictions. In fact, not only are we in investing through the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, we're investing through education. And the amount of money that's been invested is above and beyond any money that's ever been invested by any government even the one that you, uh, when, they, when your government was in power. We are making a substantial difference and laying transformational change in a system that was broken long before we came into power. And the pandemic, which exacerbated the situation, is being addressed as well with the investments that are being made, which now total more than $525 million annually. In fact, Children's Mental Health Answer. Ontario said the government's new mental health and addiction strategy, the Roadmap to Wellness, is a start towards making the transformational changes to address the gaps in service and wait times for children and youth, mental health and addictions. And we will continue making those investments, notwithstanding. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Deputy Leader. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to remind the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions that it was this government that cut planned increases in 2018 to the mental health budget. But it doesn't have to be this way for children in our province, Speaker. When experts like Children's Mental Health Ontario call on us to invest, 
the, to cut the wait lists and build capacity, they can count on new Democrats to support that call to action. But children in Ontario can't count on this government to do the same. Under the Liberals, the wait list should have never reached two and a half years for children to see a mental health care professional. And the wait lists were made even worse when this Premier made cuts rather than investments when taking office. Speaker, will the government recognize now is the time for universal mental health care services to be a part of OHIP and use the upcoming budget to build a better mental health care system for our children and people across Thank you. Ontario? I recognize the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, I thought this issue was addressed the last time it was asked. The $325 million that's being referred to is, in fact, a campaign promise by okay. a government that got seven seats in Very the last election. This government invested a 5% increase over the amount that was invested previously by previous governments. This government is making transformational changes in a system that was broken long before we came to power. In 2010, with your members as part of that standing committee, talked about lack of access, fragmentation, a broken system. It took this government to build a roadmap to wellness that is making transformational changes, and it's backed by an investment of $525 million annualized, $3.8 billion over 10 years. We will not take lessons nor listen to the delusions that somehow we've reduced spending on mental health. That's preposterous. I can't even comment on that. And this is not the first. It's the tenth time I've heard the same nonsense coming out of the Thank you. opposition. Supplementary, I recognize the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, this morning the Equal Pay Coalition was at Queen's Park together with leaders of the Ontario Federation of Labour, the Ontario Nurses Association, and SEIU Healthcare. They were here to sound the alarm on the Ford government's attack on the collective bargaining and pay equity rights of nurses, PSWs, and many other women workers in healthcare and social services. Uh, Speaker, the coalition and labour leaders are united in calling on this government to repeal Bill 124, withdraw Bill 106, pay health care workers what they deserve, and stop overriding women's rights to pay equity. Speaker, why did this government decide to gut pay equity in Bill 106 instead of simply paying PSWs, nurses, and other public sector Question. workers what they deserve? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Labour and Skills. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, so much, and I thank the member opposite uh, for this question. First, I want to begin by thanking all of those frontline health care workers who have worked every single day to protect our families uh, and all of our communities. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I also uh, want to take this opportunity to uh, personally pay tribute to a trailblazer uh, in this province, and that is a former Premier uh, Kathleen Wynne, the member from Don Valley West. Mr. Speaker, uh, she blazed a trail. She inspired uh, many people across this province. And, Mr. Speaker, I just want to share uh, a story. Uh, we all know that the premiers have a hectic schedule, uh, a busy schedule. But for me, I remember uh, this one moment at Queen's Park when I was back in opposition, critical of uh, the former government. But my daughter uh, was out front of the legislature, and the premier uh, took time. Uh, to come over and, and talk to her as a, as a young uh, lady. So I yes, want to sir. say uh, to the Premier, uh, the former Premier, on behalf of uh, the province of Ontario, on behalf of this government, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. New question. I recognize the member for. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. My apology. My apology. Supplementary. The member from London West. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. They say there's a reason why this is called question period and not answer period. Uh, Speaker, Bill 106 overturns hard won Supreme Court victories on pay equity. It is a direct attack on the rights of women in health and social services who have carried us through this pandemic. It is unconstitutional interference with collective bargaining rights, just like the Ford government's earlier attack on workers with Bill 
124. Speaker, an Environics poll commissioned by the Equal Pay Coalition was released this morning, showing that 85 per cent of Ontarians believe it is important for the government to do more to promote women's economic equality. That means decent wages and working conditions like permanent paid sick days. Speaker, Ontario voters care about women's economic equality. Question. Why doesn't this government? I return to the Minister of Labour and Skills. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is uh, a priority of this uh, government, and I want to remind uh, the member opposite that everyone deserves equal pay regardless uh, of their gender. And Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank the Pay Equity Commissioner, uh, Katie Ward, who I appointed uh, a couple of years ago. She's doing uh, great work to ensure that uh, you know, women have equal pay uh, in this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Katie Ward, the new Pay Equity Commissioner, comes with a, a wealth of experience. Uh, she's worked uh, in the Ukraine, and I think it's important to note that uh, many of the Ukrainian refugees that are going to be coming here uh, are going to be women and children, and we're going to be there with supports for uh, these women and children that come here. That's why I was proud to join the Minister of Health, the Premier, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure yesterday, and Ukrainian-Canadian leaders uh, to announce uh, over $300 million in supports for Ukrainian refugees to find safe haven uh, here in Ontario and to build uh, better lives for them. That was a test just to make sure the House was paying attention and to hold the Speaker accountable, so thank you very much. It is now time for a new question. The member from Mississauga Centre has the floor. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I've heard from so many constituents in my riding of Mississauga Centre who are very concerned after the federal government raised the price of the carbon tax last Friday. Speaker, these people are hardworking Ontario families, moms, dads, seniors and our young people who have had a very, very long two years. And as the costs continue to rise, especially the cost of living, this tax increase almost couldn't come at a worse time. Speaker, through you, how is the minister and the government planning to address these tax hikes imposed by the federal government and cut costs for Ontario families? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre. And if I could just say here in the House, I'd like to personally thank her for her incredible work, not just on the front lines through the pandemic as a nurse and representing her profession, but also and especially her incredible advocacy for the most vulnerable and marginalized in her community and indeed across the entire province of Ontario. But my colleague is completely right. Our government understands that taxpayers are under pressure. We recognize the impact that inflation and especially the significant impact of rising gasoline and fuel prices is having on businesses and families. And our government is here for them. That's why we, as that's why, as we have as part of our plan to provide relief across the board, our government has introduced the Tax Relief of the Pumps Act that would, if passed, temporarily cut gas tax by 5.7 cents Answer. per litre and the fuel tax by 5.3 cents per litre for six months beginning in July 1st. Speaker, this is just one part of our plan to cut costs for every Ontarian. Thank you. Supplementary, I return the member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that response. It's great to hear that our government has taken the initiative so quickly after the disappointing increase in the carbon tax by the federal government, ensuring Ontarians keep more money in their pockets, not the government pockets. After 15 long years of liberal mismanagement, it's great to be a part of a government that is working for the taxpayer, for the people, in so many ways. But with so much ongoing economic and world uncertainty, the pressure that so many Ontarians are under due to inflation and rising costs is becoming very difficult to bear, Speaker. Through you, what is the minister and the government's plan to help build Ontario and cut costs for Ontario's hardworking families? Recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the great question from the member from Mississauga Centre. And she's absolutely right. Ontarians have faced a tough two years from the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impacts. No government better understands that. And that's why we are continuing to call on the federal government to do the right thing and join Ontario in providing relief for families and workers by cutting the carbon tax. The Tax Relief at the Pumps Act is just a part, one part of our plan to continue to build Ontario and to keep more money flowing into the pockets of hard-working Ontarians. 
from removing unfair road tolls on Highway 412 and 418 imposed by the Del Duca government to eliminating license plate renewal fees and stickers to providing tax relief for seniors, workers and families. This government is keeping costs down for the people of Ontario. Speaker, we on this side of the Answer. House are the only party that says yes to the people of Ontario and has a plan to fight for them. Thank you. Thank you. New question. I recognize the member from Thunder Bay, Atticoke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, Northwestern Ontario has a dire shortage of physicians, and it needs to be addressed now. For example, the CEO of the Lake of the Woods District Hospital told Kenora Online he has never seen this many vacancies. Because of the lack of staff, the ICU had to close 14 times since September. One of the biggest barriers to solving this problem is that the hospital has great difficulty recruiting doctors. The government knows that even with the expansion of the spots at Nossum, it will take many years to clear the current physician shortage of 325 doctors, and that number will continue to rise. What is this government going to do to immediately address the physician shortage in northwestern Ontario? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, our government did make a commitment to end hallway health care, and that starts with improving access to primary care services for those living in rural and Ont northern Ontario. We do understand that there's a particular concern in northern Ontario with attracting and retaining physicians. But we have both long-term and short-term solutions to that problem. We are providing $6.2 million across 32 primary care teams to improve access to primary care in high-needs communities across the province. We also have, in terms of short-term solutions, I know it's not ideal, but we do have locum placements in many northern communities. But I think the biggest long-term solution that we have is increasing the number of placements in our medical schools across the province of Ontario, which were not dealt with Answer. by previous governments. But I can speak to that more specifically in the supplemental. Thank you. The supplementary return member from Thunder Bay, Atticoken. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Every, almost every day, I hear from constituents who have trouble accessing primary health care. This has impacts. When we tell people in a pandemic that you need to consult with your physician and they don't have one, it's a problem. As the NASM phys Physician Workforce Strategy makes clear, we need short, medium, and long-term solutions to ensure that health care needs of Northerners are taken care of. Experts say solutions involve training new doctors, of course, recruiting doctors from other places, and retaining doctors we have working in the region now. Physicians are burning out. They're desperate. They're leaving. This needs to be systematic, systemic, coordinated approach. What is this government going to do to ensure that there is a systemic approach to the physician shortage in Northern Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. I return to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, we are taking a systemic approach to dealing with this situation with a variety of solutions. One is, as I previously said, it increasing the allocations to our primary health care teams. But there's also virtual care, which is becoming more and more common. More and more Ontarians want to use that. We are digitizing our health care records. We are also allowing people in Northern Ontario to obtain the solutions and assistance from physicians in other locations. And as you've mentioned, the most important thing that we're doing is increasing the number of doctors that we actually have in the province of Ontario. We're increasing the number of placements by 160 undergraduate seats and 295 postgraduate seats, of which the Northern Ontario School of Medicine will be receiving 30 undergraduate and 41 postgraduate seats. That's really important for people who live in Northern Ontario to be able to train in Northern Ontario, and it's much more likely that they will stay in Northern Ontario. Answer. That is a true long-term solution to this problem. Thank you. New question. I recognize the member from Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. The objectives of Directive 6 issued by Dr. Moore were to set out a provincially consistent approach to COVID-19 immunization policies. While Directive 6 also allowed for unvaccinated students to continue to learn online, and that seemed to work okay for students whose personal choice was to not get vaccinated. It was immoral that the colleges and universities decided on their own and were allowed to further jeopardize students and teachers when they implemented an unnecessary policy of vaccinate or terminate or even lose your academic year. 
Students had, the personal re had their personal reasons for not wanting the vaccine, and it was obvious that these non-medical powers to be disregarded personal choice. Now, your government continued to allow these institutions to move far beyond Directive 6 into a heavy-handed authoritarian approach. So, Minister, will you step in and stop these non-medical educational institutions from forcing an invasive medical procedure on staff and students? Thank you. I recognize the government post leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, uh, our colleges and universities are independent uh, institutions that make uh, uh, independent decisions. Uh, the good news is, Mr. Speaker, that as the as the Minister of Health has uh, highlighted, with the high vaccination rates in the province of Ontario and the, uh, in, in the really the, the groundbreaking investments that we've made in uh, in hospital capacity and uh, preparing uh, the province of Ontario following 15 years of failure to make these uh, types of investments, Ontario is in a very good spot. Uh, uh, to weather this storm. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, it's also important to note that our colleges and universities really pivoted very quickly. Now, it took a lot of resources and, and additional funding uh, to, uh, uh, online when the pivot was necessary. The, the Minister of uh, Colleges and Universities did some great work with, uh, on that, as did the Minister of Education for our elementary and secondary school students. So we're very proud of the and fact sir? that despite a global pandemic, our students have been able to continue working. They've been continuing to graduate. They can continue to uh, 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 to provide exceptional benefit to the province of Ontario, and we'll continue to do so. For thank you. Years. Supplementary, I return the member from Chatham, Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you very much. Back to the minister. These educational institutions continue to go even further by mandating vaccines for all students and lecturers, regardless of whether students take the courses online or on campus. Does that make any sense? Students have no option. They're being coerced. Colleges and universities are now forcing students, if they want to pass, to attend classes in person to be vaccinated. If not, they are disenrolled. Students who have been disenrolled in their educational institution claim that they are unable to confirm if the student will be returning must repay their OSAP six months after that point of disenrollment. Why? Perhaps your ministry could reconsider its stand and implement a no vaccine mandate and tell these institutions they can no longer mandate vaccines. It has been said that education is something no one can take away from you. Minister, don't take students' education away. So, Minister, Question. what are you prepared to do to protect unvaccinated students who are entitled to an education and a good job? Return to the government, House Leader. Again, I uh, thank the member for the question. We've obviously uh, 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 prepared to do everything to keep people in the province of Ontario safe, including our students. That is why uh, the Minister of Education, when it comes to elementary and secondary students, has ensured that we have one of, if not the safest, return to school uh, protocols in the entire country, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Colleges and Universities, when the pandemic hit, we knew very well, Mr. Speaker, how important it was, was to allow these students to continue their education so that they could graduate, so that they could progress into the careers of the their, of, uh, of their choice, what they had worked so hard to do. That is why we put enormous resources in to allow our colleges and universities to pivot very quickly, something that they were going to do over a long period of time. We allowed it to happen uh, 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 seamlessly and, and very quickly so that they could continue to get the education that they're paying for, Mr. Speaker, and that is so vital, not Answer. only to their future, but to the future of the people of the province of Ontario. As the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade adds so many new jobs in so many different sectors of, uh, of the economy. We we need these students to continue to graduate so that they can fill the thousands of jobs that are empty and needing to be filled in the province of Ontario. They have a great future, Mr. Speaker, as do all Ontarians because of the decision. Thank you. I recognize the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Sure. We saw the Minister in Hamilton just last week making an exciting announcement at McMaster's Innovation Park to support our life sciences sector. Ontario's life sciences sector is a key part of Ontario's economy and employs thousands of workers across the province. Now more than ever, Ontarians are counting on our government to grow Ontario's life sciences sector and secure new investments in next generation health technology, medicines, and vaccine manufacturing. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell us how his ministry and our government plans to grow Ontario's biomanufacturing and life sciences sector. Thank you. 
I recognize the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Companies have made a streak of game-changing investments in Ontario in the auto sector recently. In the past 17 months, we've seen $12 billion in investments, adding thousands of jobs. But as the member pointed out, other sectors in Ontario have been seeing similar success. Over that same period of time, Ontario has welcomed investments of almost $2 billion by leading life science companies, including Sanofi, uh, Resilience, and Roche. Last week, Omnia Bio announced $580 million investment to build a new cell and gene therapy manufacturing facility at McMaster University in Hamilton. And Invest Ontario, our investment attraction agency, made their very first investment by providing $40 million. So, Speaker, Answer. whether it's a game-changing auto investment one day or a half a billion dollar life science investment another day, it's clear that Ontario is getting stronger. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary, I recognize the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, uh, Minister, for that answer. And through you, Speaker, we've seen a number of investments over the past few years which have contributed to the growth of Ontario's life science sector. I'm sure my constituents and all Ontarians are excited to hear about the record-breaking investments we've attracted as opposed to the mass exodus of jobs caused by the previous Liberal government. Speaker, through you, could the minister tell us what new investments have been made and how his ministry is positioning Ontario to be the life sciences sector hub of Canada. Thank you. Thank you to the minister. Speaker, last week we also announced a new life sciences strategy, the very first provincial strategy for that sector in more than a decade. And this announcement included $15 million for the Life Sciences Innovation Program, which helps position the sector for long-term growth, investment, and job creation. We set a lofty goal, Speaker, of 85,000 high-value jobs by 2030, focusing on four areas, growing our business biomanufacturing, building domestic PPE, boosting commercialization, and adopting innovations. Our vision, Speaker, is to establish Ontario as a global leader in biomanufacturing and life sciences, and will continue making the right strategic investments to support critical industries like our life sciences sector. New question. I recognize the member for Brenton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Times are really tough right now, and people are struggling with how expensive life is becoming, from the cost of gas to groceries to auto insurance. But instead of helping people, the Conservative government is allowing billion dollar car insurance companies to rip off Ontarians. Does the Premier think it's okay that there are people in Ontario who are paying more for car insurance than for the mortgage of their own home? Does the Premier think it's okay that there are people with clear driving records who are being charged higher rates purely based on where they live? Does the Premier think it's okay that there are people who are struggling to make ends meet because of the crushing cost of car insurance? Well, it's not okay, but the Premier is allowing it to happen. So will the Premier do the right thing and vote yes to our NDP bill to lower car insurance rates to make life more affordable? Question. I recognize the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Finance. No, thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate that question because the member is absolutely right. The people of Ontario work hard, and our government understands that the taxpayers are under pressure. That's why we've been following the auto insurance sector so very, very closely. And that's also why we had a clear message to insurance companies as we went through the COVID pandemic. You should provide relief that reflects the financial hardships your customers are facing because of COVID-19. And by encouraging and promoting timely action by insurers, our government enabled more than $1 billion in consumer savings, affecting 93 per cent of Ontario drivers. And, Mr. Speaker, we continue to remove barriers to relief, and by doing that, we're able to provide options and choice to consumers in the province of Ontario. And in fact, David Marshall's new report um, stated that FISRA since 2019 has been active in reducing regulatory burden. We support the work the regulator is doing and to cut red tape. I'll say more in the supplemental. Thank, Thank you. you. I return to the supplementary to the member from Brampton East. Back to the Premier. The only thing that the Conservative government is following is whatever their insider friends and buddies want in the insurance companies. If we look at the track record of this Conservative government, it's very clear. They have allowed rates to go up in 2018 when, the, when they first got elected. They allowed rates to go up 
when we saw traffic drop to some of its lowest during the heights of the pandemic, and now as people struggle to make ends meet, they continue to let rates go up. And in case the Conservative government was confused, let me make it clear. The buck stops with the Premier. Rates only go up when the Conservative government allow them to go up. People deserve better. They deserve to live an affordable life where they're not suffering under these crushing auto insurance premiums. So will the Premier Question. do the right thing and vote yes to our NDP bill and make life more affordable to Ontarians? Okay. I return to the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, David Marshall's new report mentioned that the, that the future of consumer services like insurance lies in being responsive to rapid changes such as pricing and innovation. We recently implemented, through FISRA, a new regulatory sandbox to test new initiatives to respond to changing consumer needs. Successful innovations from this sandbox would be delivered to the consumer market. We will continue to increase consumer choice through enabling our auto insurance to offer optional direct compensation property damage savings for good drivers with telemetrics and develop stronger anti-fraud um, uh, measures. Mr. Speaker, the key is affordability. We understand that the province of Ontario, the people of the province of Ontario, need relief. That's why Answer. we are taking measures in the auto insurance industry, at the gas pumps, uh, with your vehicle license plate stickers, in order to provide that relief to the people of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. I recognize the member from Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the key is uh, affordability. In 2018, this government made a number of promises, big promises, that they failed to deliver on, including their promise not to touch rent control. I believe the quote from the Premier at the time was, I have listened to the people, and I won't take rent control away from anyone, period. When it comes to rent control, we're going to maintain the status quo. That's May 2018, Mr. Speaker. Lo and behold, one of the very first things this Premier did was to take rent control away from thousands of Ontarians. And a year later, tenants were reporting double-digit increases. With skyrocketing housing costs right across the province, these rent controls could have provided much-needed relief to thousands of renters who are struggling to make ends meet. This is just another broken promise in the long list of broken promises from this Premier. After two years of turmoil, does the government regret breaking their 2018 commitment to maintain rent control in Ontario? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the Honourable Member for the question that gives us uh, the opportunity as a government to, uh, to talk about uh, what we promised Ontarians. We promised Ontarians from the first day we sat in the legislature that we were going to do everything we could to increase housing supply. We also <laughs> kept our promise to preserve rent control for existing tenants. It was a, it was a promise we made during the 2018 election. So, so what did that promise that was in the fall economic statement in 2018, what did it accomplish, Speaker? Well, we're now seeing purpose-built rental uh, construction, the likes that we haven't seen since the early 90s, since 1992, Speaker. In each consecutive year after our Housing Supply Action Plan, uh, communities across Ontario saw purpose-built rental uh, being constructed uh, where, where it had not been, been even thought about under the previous government. Your, your government, sir, over 15 years neglected purpose-built rental. Nothing was Thank built, you. and under our government, that changed. Thank you. I'll just remind all members to please direct their questions through the chair. I recognize the member from Orleans for the supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's talk about some of the government's promises, as the minister highlighted in his answer. They promised lower hydro rates failed. They, low, they promised lower gas prices failed. They promised a 20 percent income tax cut failed. Order. The government can come up with any excuse they want, but Ontarians know that their rent is higher today than it was four years ago. The cost of a one-bedroom rental in Ottawa is over $1,600. In Toronto, it's over $2,000. This morning, Mr. Speaker, I took a look in Brockville. It's almost $1,300, Mr. Speaker, in Brockville. Rents are sky high, and this government has done absolutely nothing to keep them under control or help Ontarians Question. with the growing costs. Will the government admit that they broke their 2018 promise to maintain rent control in Ontario and immediately bring it back to relief uh, for Ontario families? Thank you, and I return to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, you know, Speaker, um, I, I laid out the facts. Uh, on the, the state of purpose-built rental in Ontario. We're seeing 
30-year highs in communities all across Ontario, and we want to build upon that. We want to work with our municipal partners, and you know, we're all very excited about the federal budget today to see the measures that the federal government is, is putting forward, the money that they're spending. And, and I've, I've said it many times here. You know, you know, dealing with the housing supply crisis is a long-term strategy. We need all three levels of government to work. But you know what, Speaker? I'm not going to take any lessons from this guy across the way <laughs> and his party for 15 years. You know, hydro rates. You know, sit in a constituency office like I had, sir, and have every single call for week after week after week. You know, complaining about this government's inaction on the hydrofile, closing rural schools, okay. making life unaffordable, okay. choking off our medium okay. and small hospitals. I'm not going to take any lessons yeah. from this guy at all. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. New question: The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. From day one of this pandemic, our government has been committed to protecting the health, safety and well-being of the people of Ontario. But we all saw that when the pandemic was declared in March 2020, Ontario was not prepared. COVID-19 exposed long-standing gaps across our health care system, unused PPE had expired in provincial stockpiles. Ontario was reliant on other jurisdictions for supplies and provincial pandemic plans had not been updated. I was pleased to see our government release a plan to stay open to ensure we are never caught flat-footed in another emergency. Can the President of the Treasury Board tell us exactly what is in our government's plan to stay open? I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Perry Sound Muskoka for that timely question. The member is exactly right. At the outbreak of this pandemic, we were not prepared. Since March 2020, this government has made historic investments to protect the people of Ontario, but it is clear more must be done. That is why we have released a plan to stay open and introduced the Pandemic and Emergency Preparedness Act to build up our capacity to respond. These steps will expand Ontario's health care workforce, improve the production of critical supplies and build more hospital beds to ensure we have the capacity to meet any future challenges. Unlike the previous government, we understand the importance of investing in Ontario's health care system. Speaker, I will have more to say in the supplementary about this plan and how we will continue to protect the people of Ontario by keeping Ontario open. Thank you. Supplementary, I return the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Parliamentary Assistant, for that response. The pandemic brought to light long standing systemic challenges. Hallway health care has been a problem in Ontario for decades. In my writing, our hospitals are frequently well over 100% capacity, largely because of the number of ALC patients who can't get into a long term care facility or get home care. Recently, Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare has seen 40% of their beds occupied by ALC patients. Between 2011 and 2018, the Liberal government built only 611 net new long-term care beds. Meanwhile, our government has 27,148 new and 23,504 upgraded beds in the development pipeline. Back to the President of the Treasury Board, how will his legislation and a plan to stay open add more Questions? beds to our health care system? Right, Recognize the parliamentary assistant. Again, Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question. I want to thank the Minister of Long-Term Care for all the excellent work he is doing to build our long-term care homes across this province. And I also want to thank Minister Elliott. Through the Ministry of Health, we are investing $22 billion over the next 10 years to address challenges around the shortage. Here, here. These investments will increase capacity in the existing hospitals, build new health care facilities in our communities, and renew aging hospitals and community health care centres. This investment includes the launch of 50 new major projects and will add over 3,000 new beds wow. over the next decade. This is on top of the 3,100 acute and post-acute care beds this government has already added to the system. Let me be clear to the people of Ontario. We know it is Answer. our responsibility to prepare the province for future generations. And again, this Premier is getting things done. Yeah. That's a great answer. New question. I recognize the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. 
The Backdoor Mission and its Mission United Service Partners established a model of care to support the immediate crisis needs of those most in need in Oshawa. The downtown clinic has operated with one nurse practitioner, one RN, and rotating doctors providing specialist care. And the Mission United Clinic provides primary care in a full clinic to about 600 clients, individuals who previously did not receive primary care due to systemic barriers and otherwise might not. This population suffers chronic homelessness, mental health challenges and addictions, and in most cases, a complex combination of all three. And unbelievably, the funding from the province through Ontario Health East has evaporated without warning. Days ago, the medical support team found out the funding would not continue beyond March 31st, and our community and vulnerable neighbours desperately need this funding to continue. It is not hyperbole to say that lives are at stake. Question. I have sent the minister a letter outlining the situation. Will the Minister of Health commit to the funding needed immediately to run this desperately needed acute care clinic at the Backdoor Mission? Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, thank you for that question. Clearly, when it comes to mental health, addictions, and of course, health, they are interrelated, and it's extremely important that the supports and services are in place to help everyone, especially our most vulnerable. Now, I just learned of the backdoor mission. I'm not familiar with it, but I certainly would like to spend a little bit more time and understand a little bit more about it. I know, for instance, that we have made investments in ensuring that there are beds to deal with mental health and then provide supports for individuals that are homeless and of course they are an important part of our population that needs to be taken care of as well our government has made investments in durham uh, many investments including overall spending uh, of over uh, 77 million dollars in uh, health care in uh, uh, durham i'll, I'll uh, follow up with additional information on the supplemental thank, thank you. you supplementary to the member from oshawa thank you speaker and back to the minister of health please understand that many of the vulnerable clients served at the backdoor mission cannot access appropriate care anywhere else it is my understanding that more than 50 percent of the clients struggling with mental health or addictions at the backdoor mission don't have health cards or identification. They will not be served at private clinics. The clients who struggle with addictions, mental health crises, volatility and unpredictability are not going to be successful in scheduling and attending appointments. We cannot in good conscience condemn them to struggle alone without care. I've been connecting with the medical team and Nathan Gardner, the executive director at the Backdoor Mission. It's clear that without the clinic, the majority of these marginalized neighbors in need will land in the emergency room, in an ambulance, and in many cases will die. The doctors, nurses, and eight service partner or partner service providers are distraught over the uncertain future of the people they care and serve, care for and serve. For two years, this model has proven itself. Mission United partners have been jumping through hoops to achieve that sustainable funding commitment from Ontario Health. Will the minister please address the situation, commit the funds needed to keep this primary care clinic open and our struggling neighbours cared for? Thank you. Thank you. I return to the Associate Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Once again, our government is committed to ensuring that the continuum of care exists for every citizen in the, in the province of Ontario. And Durham has seen numerous investments, including in mental health of over $2.2 million in every area of public health care spending, there have been increases year over year as when, uh, with our government in, in, uh, in power. And one of the things, as I said before, when it comes to the roadmap to wellness and ensuring that there are appropriate supports for all members of our communities, those are in place and those are things that we are looking at and we do support. Uh, as I said, this is the first time I've, I've heard of the backdoor mission. I've never seen an application from them with respect to funding. Our addiction recovery fund, uh, there was no application that came forward Answer. from them. But I'm certainly interested in reviewing the situation and seeing what we can do, because everyone in the province, regardless of who they are and where they are, deserves supports here, and here. help. Yeah. Thank you. New question. I recognize a member from York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the government house leader. Voters are concerned by the increasing financial ties between the media and government. Free and independent media is a pillar of democracy. But when this government is one of the biggest Order. advertisers on all media platforms for the last two years, TV, radio, papers, internet, benches, bus shelters, highway ads, and elevator screens paid for by the government of Ontario. Speaker, I'd like the House Leader to tell us how much money did the government spend on ads paid for by the government of Ontario through all media platforms in the last two fiscal years, and will the House Leader commit to coming back with a dollar figure next week? Thank you. 
I recognize the government host leader. Uh, speaker, there's just so much to communicate, right? I mean, it is it is a challenge that we face because there is just so much good news happening across the province of Ontario. I mean, look, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has announced record-breaking investments in the automotive sector. We have to tell people about that, Mr. Speaker. Of course we have to tell people about that. $5 billion investment in new, in new uh, technology, Mr. Speaker. We want to tell people about that. We want to tell people about how we're emerging from the pandemic stronger than almost any other jurisdiction in, uh, in North America. I think that's good news. People deserve uh, to know about that, Mr. Speaker. So we're not going to apologize for letting people know how the hard work of, uh, of their government is helping Ontario succeed to become the best place in the world in which to live, work, invest, and to raise a family. You know what, Mr. Speaker? A strong, Answer. stable, majority, progressive, conservative government has delivered for the people of the province of Ontario. Over 500,000 people Thank have you. the dignity of a job now that didn't before. That's good news, and we're going to tell people about it. I return to the member from York Centre for the supplementary. Speaker, if the government House Leader is proud, uh, then why wouldn't he come back with a dollar figure? Speaker, we know that this government governs by polls. Dr. Juni estimates that there are 100 to 120,000 new daily cases each day. If three months ago in January the government put the health and safety of Ontarians first, Order. then surely they must lock us down again now, especially since protection from the vaccine has further waned and this health minister doesn't Order. believe in natural immunity. So what changed? Is it the polls months before an election or the realization that we did not need to lock down in January or last January? But this cabinet looks at polling every time it meets because the only thing it cares about is re-election. So will the House leader tell us how much taxpayer dollars were spent on public opinion polling in the last two fiscal years? And will the House leader commit to coming back with a dollar figure next week? Thank you, and the House will come to order. I recognize the member, the government House leader. Well, here's a, here's a dollar figure that the people of the province of Ontario can, uh, can count on, Mr. Speaker. After question period today, all of the members of this assembly are going to have an opportunity to vote on putting more money back into the pockets of the people of, uh, of Ontario. I hope that the member opposite will join us in doing that. They're going to have the opportunity to work to support workers, Mr. Speaker, something that has never been done by the previous Liberal government in 15 years. It took this government to get it done, Mr. Speaker. And why do we have to do this? Why are we making investments in workers? Why are we making investments in apprenticeships? In apprenticeships? Because this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, seizing on the hard work of the Minister of Energy, who brought down energy prices for the people of the province. Let's not forget, let's not forget, colleagues, when we came to office, the Liberals had scheduled a 19 per cent increase in hydro rates. Yes, sir. We cancelled it. And you know what has resulted? Thousands of jobs coming back. 500,000 people working that weren't working before. And 300,000 300, jobs that need to be filled. Ontario is moving Thank thanks you. to a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority. Thank you. Is that the point? Start the clock. I recognize the member from Meshkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Madam Minister, as you know, the residents in the north have to go often to medical appointments. Northern Health Travel Grant, the financial support does not reflect the current cost of living. Looking back at a few years ago, the travel grant covered some of the costs of medical travels. But now, with the rising cost of gas, traveling for medical reasons has become a financial burden. Speaker, will this government commit to revising their calculation of the payment considering the financial burden traveling for medical reason put on Northerners? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government certainly recognizes the unique challenges that people, especially in North, face when trying to access health care. So the Northern Health Travel Grant is continuously undergoing uh, quality improvements to make sure that people get the support they need and, of course, in a timely manner. The 2021-22 allocation for the Northern Health Travel Grant was $48.2 million. And just a few extra statistics, as Speaker, I can advise that in the 2021 fiscal year, the Ministry of Health received and processed 143,000 
495 Northern Health Travel Grant applications, and 96.10 of those uh, applications were approved, and 95 were approved within 30 business days. So, of course, we want to make sure that people can answer quickly. And so, we've also introduced a revised application form that allows clients to provide banking information so that their de the deposits can be made quickly into the bank. Thank you. But checks are also available. Supplementary, I recognize the member from Meshkegawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand that the health uh, travel grant is good for people who travel, but the uh, eligibility criteria does not respond to the conditions of the travel. Many people in my uh, riding living in the campus case, for instance, have to go elsewhere. Uh, they have to sleep in Timmins to go for their appointments unless they travel through the night. The problem at night is, is that the travel grant do, do, does not cover because they don't cover 200 kilometers, so there's not money. With the price of gas by kilometer that has not changed, it doesn't cover the travel. Madam Minister, this scenario happens every day too often, and it's unacceptable. When will your government understand the issues in the north and will redefine the eligibility conditions and payments to reflect the reality on the ground right now? I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I, uh, as I previously indicated, we are constantly reviewing the Northern Health Travel Grant, the applications, the eligibility, the payments, and so on. But we also know that because of the perilous uh, travel conditions that sometimes people are facing in Northern Ontario, that we also have to have other options for people seeking care. So in addition to traveling, we also have our digital first for health strategy, which expands the virtual care options for all Ontarians. We anticipate that that's going to increase in the coming years as we increase our digitization so that people will be able to see their own health records, they'll be able to make appointments online, and they'll be also be able to see specialists, which right now they have to physically go to visit. We want to make sure that the care can come directly to people. That's what we need to concentrate on because it's more convenient, it's more accessible for Ontarians regardless of where yes, they are in the province. Thank you. New question, I recognize the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. The head of the Ontario Science Table, Dr. Peter Uni, says that Ontario is seeing 100,000 cases of COVID each day, every day. And he adds that if we keep on this way and continue not to mask, there will be a great strain on our health care system, a tidal wave, as he describes it. The sixth wave is going to be our biggest wave yet. Yet, for one month, we have not heard from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Total radio silence. I find it hard to believe that Dr. Moore doesn't understand the importance of communication during a pandemic, especially given the risks that we face right now. It's clear that the Premier doesn't want Dr. Moore to appear publicly, and that Dr. Moore is being muzzled. Question? Speaker, will the Premier lift Question? his gag order on the Chief Medical Officer of Health? I remind all members to not use inflammatory references in the House. I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And um, I'd really like to concentrate on the facts here. The facts are that Dr. Moore has chosen not to appear in regular conferences because, in his words, we have to learn to live with COVID as it is now. We can't continue to have to need weekly updates when we know that we are seeing an increase, but the increase is manageable. Dr. Moore is free to come forward at any time as he sees fit to continue with those uh, conferences, but he is the one that chose not to do so on the basis that we have to learn to live with COVID. So we are respecting that. We are providing daily updates to people. The information is readily available to everyone. But as Dr. Moore himself has said, we should not be surprised to see an increase in the number of cases that we're seeing in Ontario because we have released a number of the public health measures Answer. and we have a more transmissible variant. But vaccination is the key to success to this. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the Chief Medical Officer of, of Health works for the government. Right? So it's clear they don't believe that he should be communicating either. So for two years, Ontarians have relied on regular communications, both from Dr. Williams and Dr. Moore. They relied on 
on those briefings and those doctors for information and tools they needed to keep them and their families safe. And now we're facing what looks like it's going to be the biggest wave, and there is a vacuum, a vacuum of leadership. The Chief Medical Officer of Health is, is nowhere to be found. It's simply not believable to me, and I think anyone else here, that Dr. Moore doesn't feel a responsibility to do what he's been doing all along and what every other medical officer of health is doing across Ontario. Question. I know the Premier doesn't want COVID to interfere with his election plans, and that's why he's muzzling the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Once again, will the Premier rescind his gag order on the Chief Medical Officer of Health? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Health. What the member opposite is saying is ridiculous and is not based on fact whatsoever. It's absolutely not the case. Doc the member from Ottawa South will come to order. Please resume. Dr. Moore is independent. He always has been. He's always stated what he believes to be important for the member from Ottawa South will come to order. Please carry on. Any suggestion that Dr. Moore is doing anything other than what he thinks is in the best interests of the people of Ontario is absolutely untrue. Dr. The Moore member from Ottawa South will come to order. As he sees fit, he knows that he can do that, and he has done so Answer. throughout his term as our Chief Medical Officer of Health. In the meantime, information is readily available to the people of Ontario. They can find out what the case rates are, what the hospitalization rates are, and so on. We believe in free and public accountability. Thank you. I recognize the member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mike Bernardo owns Bernardo Karate in London, and each time he's contacted the support line, he's been told his application is being processed and that he just has to wait. So he's been left in the dark waiting for the grant. Another small business owner, Paul Nuther, who owns an awards and trophy shop, he, like Michael, received the grant during the first round last year. Paul contacted me and asked why his business was no longer eligible for the grant despite having to be closed in January. Meanwhile, Speaker, during the last round, grants this, this government gave grants to businesses who didn't qualify and corporations who weren't even in Ontario. Can the minister explain what the delay is in distributing the grants to businesses owners like Michael and explain to Paul why some Question. businesses who were eligible during the last round are no longer eligible this round and why there's no appeal process for that decision? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Our government's track record proves that we have been there for small businesses during the pandemic. We've provided $51 billion as part of the COVID-19 action plan, and that includes the Small Business Relief Grant. Now, we are working with all businesses who have submitted applications. It's our duty, Speaker, to verify their eligibility for that program. And because we need to ensure that businesses who applied are, in fact, eligible, they need to confirm that eligibility by providing correct documentation. And we are trying to speed up the review process by encouraging all businesses to respond to our requests for information, submit a yes, complete sir? package, proper CRA numbers, proper banking numbers, and we'll work hard to deliver those funds quickly while balancing the integrity of the taxpayer-funded program. Yes. That concludes the time for question period.